Hello, my name is Matthew Hunter with Legacy Wilderness Academy, and I'm on a mission to document every edible and medicinal plant in the southeastern U.S. so Southerners can have greater access to nutritious food and free medicine. In today's video, we're going to be looking at one of the top survival foods in the eastern and southern U.S. It's called a sugarberry or hackberry. Now, there are a lot of so-called survival foods in the world of foraging, but I think that hackberry truly ranks among the top. Not only is the fruit of hackberry high in calories, this is also an abundant and widespread tree that can be found throughout almost all of the central and eastern U.S., as well as throughout big chunks of the western U.S. So after 10 years of foraging experience, over 10 years of foraging experience under my belt, I think it's safe to say that this is one of the plants that can truly and realistically provide for you and your family in the event of an emergency. And there are a couple caveats to that statement that we'll go through in the video, but this is truly a survival food if there ever was one. So in this video, we're gonna look at how to identify the hackberry tree. I'm going to harvest some of the fruit, then I'll take it home and I'll show you how to prepare it. Stay tuned. By the way, if you enjoy this video and you also want to learn more about medicinal plants, make sure to download yourself a copy of my free guide to medicinal plants of the Southeast, which you can find in the link in the description below this video. The easiest way to recognize a hackberry tree is by its gray bark that is covered in warts or bumps. Now there are actually four different species that this video applies to. The identification of all four of them is going to be very similar and their food use is virtually identical. So we're going to talk about those four different species, but keep in mind the features we're about to look at are going to apply to all four species. There are only slight variations from species to species and maybe the exact size of the leaf or some uh, little small features on the leaves. But really, if you can identify one, you can identify all four and uh, they're very, very distinct trees. So let's take a closer look at the bark. If we take a close up look of the bark of this hackberry tree, you can see that the little warts or bumps coming off of it are comprised of layers. So if you look really close, it has these layered bumps that look a lot like sedimentary rock. So this is an extremely distinct feature that you can really recognize from a distance. And then all you have to do is walk up and take a closer look. And if you see these distinct layers, along with some of the other features we're about to look at, you can be sure that you have your identification correct. Next, we'll look at hackberry leaves. So here I have a hackberry leaf, and we wanna keep in mind that from species to species, the size may vary. So some may be smaller than this. We also wanna keep in mind that the uh, edges of the leaf may vary even within the same species as to whether or not they are uh, smooth on the margins or whether or not they have teeth. So this one has no teeth. Uh, and really what we wanna do is look at the back because there's a couple features I wanna point out that are easier to see from the back. The first, is that hackberry leaves all have three primary veins. And so one of the trees that can kind of get mixed in with hackberry is elm, but elm leaves only have one primary vein. So you'll notice three primary veins originating there from the base. You're also gonna notice that the leaf base is asymmetrical oftentimes on hackberry leaves. So you'll notice that this um, side comes down further than this side. So it's like lopsided or asymmetrical. Another feature commonly seen on hackberry leaves are these little bumps, which are actually caused from an insect, and these are called hackberry nipple galls. So the insect comes to lay its eggs in the leaf, and the tree's response to that is to create this little bump, okay? And these bumps are so common that they can actually be oftentimes used as an identification feature. In some areas, the trees are just covered with them. And you may actually think that the tree has sort of a diseased look, like there's something wrong with it, but it's just caused from an insect. It's the tree's response to the insect. And the good thing is that they do not affect the fruit at all. So even if you see these all over the leaves, don't worry, the fruit is still gonna be perfectly fine. The fruit of hackberry ripen around the month of September. They're small about the size of a pea. They don't look like a survival food, I know. You'll have to trust me on that. They have a large seed surrounded by a thin, sweet flesh. They're usually a reddish color. Depending on the species, they can be a somewhat purplish color. And they can often be found months after they ripen. So they are high in sugar and they are also have some oils in them. And so because of that, they really preserve well and they, they tend to not fall to the ground very often. So really, I mean, even months sometimes after they ripen in September, you can still find them preserved, uh, perfectly good to harvest on the trees. So an excellent plant in that regard. And uh, next, let's talk a little bit more about these fruit. Then we're going to harvest some, take them home, and I'll show you how to process them. 
So like I said, there are about four species of hackberry that are all identified very similarly and are used similarly. So let's look at where they grow. The first one we're going to look at is known as sugarberry or southern hackberry. It's Celtis levigata. It's the southeastern species. You can see where it grows on the map that I'm showing you here. There's another species that is also in the same range. I'm not going to show the map, but it very closely mirrors the range of the sugarberry. It's called the dwarf hackberry and it is very similar. It's just a little bit smaller and it tends to grow on the drier sites, whereas sugarberry is very much a bottomland species. You're going to see it grow in um, almost in the swamp, not quite in the swamp, but really wet areas, oftentimes maybe like next to a pond in some of those lower wet areas. The next species we're going to look at is the common hackberry or Celtis occidentalis. You can see that this species is much more of a Midwestern species. You can find it sort of in the uh, northern half of the eastern U.S. And then we'll also look at a western species called the western hackberry or Celtis reticulata. This species again is very similar to the other two and it's going to be found, it's the most drought tolerant, so it's going to be found more in like west Texas, central Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, throughout uh, parts of New Mexico, throughout uh, the higher elevation areas in Arizona, oftentimes along waterways and then even in some of the drier parts of Oregon. So here are where these different species grow. As you can see, just about anywhere you live in the U.S., especially in the eastern U.S., you're going to be able to find these trees. Okay, so I haven't really found an especially fast way to harvest hackberries. A lot of times you would put a tarp down underneath the tree and shake it, and all the berries would fall off for different, you know, fruit species. In this case, hackberries tend to hang tenaciously onto the tree. So the only thing I'm going to do that's going to speed up the process is wear a little berry bucket or blicky as they're called. And that's going to enable me to pick with both hands at the same time instead of just holding a bag and doing one hand. So that's, hey, twice the speed, not too bad. And then I'm going to situate myself on the underside of the branches if possible because hackberries really hide underneath the leaves. So if you're facing the tree, you won't see a lot of them. But if you're coming on the underside of the tree, then uh, you're going to see a lot of them. So I'm just going to be picking these one by one dropping them in the bucket and getting as many as I can, you're not going to really get um, a huge amount doing this. It won't look like a lot, but because they're so high in carbohydrates, um, it's still going to be a very much a calorie efficient food. It's amazing how important this tree was in times past and in contrast, how little people in the modern day know about it. So not only do we have numerous Native American records of people utilizing the fruit, the fruit of hackberry have actually been found in archaeological sites all around the globe. There's different species in different parts of the world, but hackberry fruit have been found in archeological sites in North America, in Central America, in the Mediterranean basin, in parts of Africa, in parts of Europe, and in parts of Asia. This suggests, highly suggests, that people all around the world have been using the fruit ever since mankind was expelled from the garden. So there are a few different things that you need to know to be able to utilize the fruit. Like I said, there are some caveats to this being an important survival food. A few things we need to know. First off is that not all hackberry trees set fruit. Um, there is some element of randomness to which ones fruit and which ones do not. But in my experience, it's usually the ones growing in full sun or at least with a decent amount of sunlight that are going to fruit the best. And that's really with any fruit or nut tree. You'll notice that the ones growing in a lot of shade or in like the deep woods set almost no fruit, uh, whereas ones in full sun produce a lot of fruit. So this makes it to where um, really a small percentage of hackberry trees in a given area are actually going to have enough fruit to harvest. The second big issue that you're going to run into is the fruit being way up in the tree. So a lot of times the branches are not low enough to be able to pick the fruit. Uh, so, and I'm going to show you a scene here where the ones are grown out in the open have branches that are really low. So what happens when a plant is growing in full shade, it tends to grow up towards the light. And because it's reaching up, it doesn't put out a lot of low branches, but the ones that are growing in full sun are going to have branches that are a lot lower down. And so searching for a hackberry tree that actually has fruit on it and that is low enough for you to harvest is really like a treasure hunt, which all foraging is. But once you do find one, it'll oftentimes have hundreds and hundreds of fruit on it. The third problem you want to be on the lookout for is this black mold that can sometimes grow on hackberry trees. It's called the black sooty mold fungus and it can affect the fruit. So uh, be aware that this can be a problem in some areas more than others. 
So if this ends up being a problem in your area and you wanna use hackberry as a survival food, make sure that you scope out multiple different stands in different locations to increase your likelihood that you will be able to have access to mold-free fruit. Finally, let's look at how to process the fruit. So one of the reasons that hackberry has not been given a lot of attention is because at first glance, it's just a tiny little pea-sized fruit with a rock-hard seed. The sugar berries in the South have really hard seeds. You could actually crack your tooth on it. The uh, common hackberry, that's more of the Midwest species, has been reported that the seed can be a lot softer to actually chew through it. But here in the South, what you have to do is crush it up in some way before you consume it. And there is a lot of sugar in the hackberry, so once you crush it up, it turns into this sort of sweet granola bar. And so I'll show you here how I crush the seeds up in a mortar pestle. I used to do it in a coffee grinder, but the seeds are so hard that it really makes the coffee grinder do some work, and it's not good for anything other than a very small amount. And even that, I'd rather just have a mortar pestle. So you can form it into these bars and actually make granola bars. And if you grind them up enough, the little bits of seed are not gonna to be too annoying to sort of chew around. And you can also add things like peanut butter and chocolate chips, really just make homemade granola bars. Now, if you really don't like the feeling of those little bits of seed, you can also make what we call hackberry milk. And you make that by boiling the hackberry uh, mush that you've just crushed up. And whenever you boil it, it turns into this almost orangish drink. It's really thick, it tastes good and it's just like nourishing. It, you could just tell it's really got some weight to it as far as uh, being a food source. And so obviously in survival mode, we wanna eat the plant, get as much of the calories as we can. But if you're just wanting to enjoy the plant, you can also make this hackberry milk, add a little bit of honey if you want to, add a little bit of cinnamon, and it's a nice holiday drink. So that's how we use the hackberry. Again, this is a very much a calorie efficient tree. If you can find a tree with limbs that uh, are producing a lot of fruit, that they're in reach, it's not moldy, you can do it. So this is a plant that you can rely on to feed your family in an emergency if you can find the fruit. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed learning about the survival food potential of the hackberry or sugarberry tree. If you wanna see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe because I'm gonna be continually releasing videos on edible and medicinal plants. And if you wanna get my free guide to medicinal plants of the Southeast, you can also find that in the link in the description below this video. Again, my name is Matthew Hunter. Have a great day.